Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. I'm Corey Crystal, a project leader at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and we are so glad to have you joining us today to talk about the energy workforce. Um, before we kick off the session, I want to express our thanks to the Department of Energy's Wind Energy Technology Office, as well as the American Wind Energy Association, whose support and partnership have made this webinar series possible. We're really looking forward to this week, starting with today's session on the wind energy workforce. Tomorrow, we will hear from a panel of industry educators and students as they discuss the importance of starting young, engaging the future workforce in elementary and secondary education. Um, our final webinar on Wednesday morning will bring awareness to post-secondary wind education programs and continue part of today's discussion on wind workforce gaps with a panel that will explore further some of the insights you will hear today. Before we get started today, it would be great to get a sense of who, who is viewing the webinar. We'll pause for a moment to let you fill out this poll, letting us know which part of the wind industry you're in. If you're not in the wind industry, please use the chat box to let us know which part of the industry or another sector that you represent. So it looks like we've got a lot of folks who are in education and training, and then a number um, and a large portion as well who are not in the wind energy workforce. So it, it's great to have so many different um, folks uh, part of this today. Um, so thank you everyone for participating in that and letting us know who's here. Um, Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce our moderator today, um, who will be Suzanne Tagan. She's the Assistant Director of the Center for the New Energy Economy at Colorado State University. She has expertise in energy economics and policy and a PhD in energy policy from the University of Colorado. At the center, she works on clean energy policy education, research, and solutions for decision makers, including state legislators, governor's energy offices, and others. Her current work also includes research on the equitable transition from coal power in rural America. Suzanne came from, to see an EE from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where she spent 14 years as an energy analyst, researcher, and manager of the Technology Engineering and Deployment Group for Wind and Water Power. She has authored or co-authored over 50 reports focused on domestic renewable energy jobs, stakeholder engagement, and the levelized cost of wind energy. She co-wrote a report on clean energy policies for the Clean Energy Ministerial's Clean Energy Solutions Center and received the Ministerial's C3E Mid-Career Award in 2016. She represents the United States in the International Energy Agency's Social Science of Wind Energy Acceptance Task and has made countless presentations on responsible renewable energy development across the country. Before graduate school, Tegan worked for the U.S. Antarctic Program at the South Pole and McMurdo Stations and for the Center for Resource Solutions in San Francisco. Beyond her job requirements, she is passionate about mentoring and education mentoring and energy education, diversity, and inclusivity. She is a founding member of Women of Renewable Industries and Sustainable Energy and served on their executive committee for nine years. So I'm excited to turn this over to Suzanne. Great. Thanks, Corey. I am so glad to be here with you all for this very important topic and series. Um, getting an idea of what our workforce looked like up to 2020 and how people can enter the clean energy industry is, I know, top of mind to so many people in school and looking for work and the people who are hiring. Um, so as our country transitions to a clean energy economy, virtual panel, panels like this one and discussions are more important than ever. And um, with that, I want to introduce Josh Williams, our first speaker. And he's the president and founder of VW Research. He's been leading and directing applied economic and market research <clears throat> for almost 20 years. 
His work tackles the tough questions around the changing nature of work, the innovation of industry lead, uh, clusters, and the evolution of regions as they look to expand economic opportunity and a higher quality of life. The firm's research is focused on supporting decision makers with evidence-based analyses that lead to strategic recommendations. And before he founded VW Research in 2006, he was the director of research for another West Coast-based research firm. Um, with pa a passion and deep understanding of applied research, Josh is committed to providing insightful research that supports stronger communities, employment pathways, and an economic opportunity. So th this is a perfect uh, webinar for him to be presenting in. Um, he also received his bachelor's degree in international economics from George Washington University, his master's degree in economics from Cal uh, California State University at Longmont, uh, Long Beach. And when he's not actively engaged in research, he spends time with his family, coaching rugby, or paddling in the ocean. So Josh, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. I'm um, excited to, to be here. I also say when I was at GW, I was an intern at uh, American Wind Energy Association. So uh, this feels like uh, full circle. I'm excited to uh, be a part of this. Um, okay, with that, um, we've what we want to go, what I'd like to go over today uh, is I'd like to talk about uh, USER. And so every uh, good research has to have an acronym. Uh, USER is the U.S. Energy and Employment Report. Uh, so I want to talk about kind of what that is, the, the methodology uh, that's used. Um, I want to then talk a little bit about the result, results uh, and really focus on wind energy um, and the wind energy workforce from kind of over the last five years from 2015 to kind of the beginning of 2020. Uh, and then lastly, we want to talk about some of the some of the research that our firm has been doing uh, as it relates to kind of the economic impacts of COVID-19 uh, on the workforce, particularly, you know, clean energy workforce and, and the implications it'll have uh, for a user in 2021. Um, so with that, uh, those are kind of the three things I'd like to go over, uh, and I'll jump right into it. Um, so, um, so as I said, uh, user is uh, this uh, this is the U.S. Energy and Employment Report. It's actually in its sixth year. So uh, this will be the sixth year. The first year we did it was in uh, 2015. And really, when we say user 2020, we're really we're kind of a year behind. So we'll, we're looking at kind of employment in 2019. So user 2021, uh, which has been authorized uh, by Congress. Uh, as, and instruct the Department of Energy to, to conduct in 2021. We'll really look at energy employment uh, in you know in the current year in, in 2020. Um, and really, the purpose of of, of of users to provide a you know a very a consistent measure of employment and economic uh, economic activity in energy markets. And energy is important in, for a lot of reasons, but but it's also it doesn't fit well. You know, if you try to look at it in traditional kind of industry classifications. Uh, NAICS codes or SOX codes or some of these these acronyms that we use to look at occupations and industries it doesn't fit well in any of them. So part of what user does is it gives you a really kind of expansive view of kind of energy, energy, the energy workforce, and, and we've split it in lots of different ways. So we look at kind of traditional industry, um, traditional industry companies, and utilities, and coal, natural gas. We look at renewable energy, you know, and then we'll look at motor vehicles and, and energy efficiency. Uh, and again, um, one of the values is your ability to kind of lots of different organizations and agencies use this data because it can be cut into both by different energy sectors, uh, energy components, uh, meaning renewable energy, you know, fossil fuels, uh, nuclear, and it, but it can also uh, be looked at by different industry sectors, so special and business services, construction, you know, manufacturing, um, and, and the like. Um, the methodology is uh, pretty extensive. Uh, it relies on both kind of modeling and extensive secondary research, as well as a, a comprehensive annual survey research effort. Um, we do what's called a known and known sampling, um, and every year we end up contacting about 25,000 um, energy firms or firms that are doing energy-related work, and we can talk about the, the difference of that but, and how we, how we count those differences. Uh, the primary sectors, the primary energy sectors for, for user are, are fuels, uh, electric uh, power generation, transmission, distribution and storage, energy e efficiency, uh, and motor vehicles and component parts. So if we look at the, just the top four, kind of fuels, uh, electric power generation, transmission, distribution and storage, energy efficiency, 
those four sectors alone account for, you know, or, or last year, at the end of 2019, they represented almost 7 million jobs, just under 5% of the entire U.S. energy workforce. Um, so this is, you know, obviously an important employer, sizable, but it also is highly interconnected to lots of other uh, components of uh, the U.S. economy. So VW spends a lot of time looking at the energy industry, not only because the energy industry has a big impact both economically and environmentally um, on our world, but also because it's highly connected uh, to a lot of the economic activity um, that that we track and we follow. Um, so why is why are we why why was why did user come about? Well, energy is volatile. It's an evolving industry sector that is highly integrated in our economy. But I think it's also really important um, to notice that there's been extensive changes to the economy or to the uh, energy economy, and it doesn't fit well into a lot of the traditional um, kind of in, um, economic approaches. Whether again, whether we're talking about NAICS codes or um, you know standard occupational classifications. So part of it is is looking at those changes and putting them in a format that allows us to, 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 to cut up and, and analyze the data in different ways. It's also, part of this is we will be uh, starting the user 2021 here. We're actually we've already started planning and we'll be doing you know, surveys. We really need your, your help and cooperation. If you get a, an email or a phone call, uh, please uh, consider uh, uh, participating in surveys. Surveys are getting harder and harder, particularly for what we call B2B or business surveys. Uh, to get completion, so um, please participate if you if given the opportunity. So with that, I've hopefully given you a little background and kind of the methodology and, and how we do uh, user. Let's talk about some of the results. Um, when we're we're going to look specifically, and, and, and the wind energy workforce is one part of you know one part of kind of this larger energy workforce uh, kind of puzzle, um, and it includes both firms that just do you know or primarily do wind energy work, but it also includes, you know, individuals that work, let's say, at a construction firm or construction that are doing, you know, putting up uh, wind turbines, right? So we wouldn't include the entire construction firm, but we'd include those individuals that work on uh, wind energy related work. It's important to note if somebody works on, you know, let's say they work in wind energy and solar, they wouldn't be counted twice. So we would, you know, we determine kind of which is which do you do more? Do you do more wind energy work or solar work? If let's say it's solar, then they'd be solar. If it's more wind energy, they would just be wind energy. So our qualifying workers are not double counted. They go into the primary energy and or the energy industry that they indicate they do more than than any others. Um, in 2019, uh, the the wind energy workforce represented about 115,000 workers. Uh, or another way of looking at it is about 13% of all kind of electric power generation employment uh, in the U.S. Um, and wind energy actually employs more people than any other sector uh, in electric power generation, or EPG as the acronym is, except for solar. Uh, solar had, you know, about twice as many workers with just under 250,000. That was more than coal, uh, advanced natural gas, uh, and uh, nuclear. Um, you can see uh, in this next slide, uh, we have employment, you know, over the last uh, five years um, from about 77,000 wind energy workers uh, in 2015 to about 115,000 uh, at the end of, uh, of, of 2019. Um, so the wind energy workforce has grown by, by almost 50% uh, in that five-year period. Uh, and when we look at wind energy employment by the different sectors, um, you can see, you know, construction uh, is the, the largest sector, which is, um, uh, is typical uh, of, of energy, of electric power generation se uh, sectors that are growing, that are growing pretty quickly. Uh, professional business services represents about a quarter uh, of all uh, wind, energy, uh, wind energy employment. Manufacturing, just under a quarter. Wholesale trade, just about 11%. Utilities and other are actually relatively small, combined uh, make up less than 10 Sector. Look at some of the some of the key kind of findings uh, from last year. Um, about 80% of wind energy employers uh, were having difficulty uh, hiring new workers, either very difficult or somewhat difficult finding hiring new workers. Uh, and the difficulties were greatest really in the construction and manufacturing sectors uh, of the wind energy workforce. Um, wind energy employers, primarily in professional and business services and wholesale trade. In fact, it also see the, the, you know, the, the highest growth in 2020. Um, and it's funny, we've actually looked at 
uh, kind of employment in electric power generation after COVID, and and you know professional business services have actually seen um, the least amount of decline. Kind of the entire industry has declined because of COVID. Um, but professional business services has been one of the areas that's kind of seen the least of that of that negative impact. Uh, when we look at the kind of the profile of, of the wind energy workforce, um, and this is you know comes from you know this is, represents kind of 2019. One of the things that'll be interesting to look at is we look at kind of user 2021 and, and how COVID uh, and how that's impacted the economy is potentially how it could have changed this workforce pro profile. But you can see that about almost 70% of the workforce is male. Um, and only, you know, just under a third is female uh, compared to, you know, the, I have a, the national uh, averages, the national workforce, 53% is male, 47% is female. So this is considerably more male uh, than, your, than your, your average kind of uh, U.S. workforce. Um, but it's actually a little more Hispanic uh, or, or uh, Latinx. So about a fifth uh, of workers are identify as Hispanic or, or Latinx compared to about 18% nationally. Uh, it's actually more Asian. About 10% um, are uh, in the wind energy workforce. Are about one in 10 are, are Asian compared to 6% in the national workforce. Um, it's actually less. Um, uh, the the African American uh, worker represents about 8% of wind energy workers, where where the the national average is about 12%. Uh, and then it's a little bit less white actually uh, than the national average, with about 69% uh, white compared to 78% national average. And veterans. As a relatively high veteran uh, component, with about nine percent of the workforce veteran compared to six percent nationally, um, and the unionization numbers are almost right in line, about six percent, uh, with what we see nationally. So um, that gives you hopefully some idea of kind of how big the wind energy workforce is, what it looks like, some of the challenges they're facing. Um, but it's important to recognize all of that data really represent represented wind energy really at the end of 2019. January 2020. So what I want to look at now is I want to look at kind of how we've seen how COVID-19 uh, and what we're expecting to talk about or look at uh, in the upcoming uh, user 2021 research. Um, you know, one of the things we've done is we, we haven't been able to do as many, we haven't been able to do the, the new user 2021 survey, but we have been able to kind of model and look at um, how energy and particularly clean energy employment has changed. Uh, from March to, to June, and we're, you know, we will be presenting actually in the next probably next few days by the end of the week. BW Research and uh, EFI and um, uh, E2 uh, will be looking at kind of their expectations for the latest kind of employment for energy employment. But as of kind of end of uh, uh, June 2020, clean energy employment saw a total decline of about 15% um, from February of 2020. So from February, March of 2020 to kind of the end of June, there's been a 15% de decline in employment, primarily because of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, renewable electric power generation did see a 3.5% kind of recovery uh, in June, uh, but you're still seeing a total employment, a total decline in employment of about 14% uh, from the pre-COVID level, pre-COVID-19 levels of, of January, February. Um, one of the kind of the negative things that you're seeing too is the numbers that we originally saw in kind of March and April had a really a large percentage. Almost all of the loss of employment was in temporary, uh, and every month we see that kind of changing. You know, the initial um, loss in temporary employment, about 90% of the workers were, were temporary, and only about you know seven to eight percent were, uh, were were permanent. We're seeing that permanent number increase every month. So you are seeing jobs slowly come back. Um, but you're also seeing the number of permanent losses increase, which is something that will be, uh, be interesting uh, to look at moving forward. Um, you know, user, 20, user 2021 will be really important because whenever you see a, a big change uh, in the, the structure uh, of, the, of the economy, and, and you know, COVID-19 is going to change the structure of really, you know, industries all over, but, but energy particularly, um, we want, you know, economic modeling is just not as effective. Secondary research, looking at the past to kind of predict the future, works pretty well when you have a kind of a nice kind of linear, slowly changing economy. It works less, it doesn't work nearly as well when you've had a really kind of volatile, uh, exogenous event like we have. And so how, how much employment will be recovered in wind energy over the next 6, 12 months will be kind of a key question. You know, how will the composition of wind energy employment change? 
old construction, manufacturing, business services, how will they recover? How will some grow faster? How will some decline uh, in this new? And, you know, we will need to, you know, we, we always, we do a mixed methodology where we're, we're modeling and we're looking at secondary data and we're also doing a really extensive kind of survey research uh, effort. The survey research effort will probably be more important in 2021 uh, because of, you know, the considerable changes uh, we're seeing in the industry. Um, so I think, you know, those are kind of the, 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 the big uh, key things I'd like you to think about. The one other thing I think that's, um, you know, worth noting is kind of energy, uh, job quality. Um, typically, wind energy has really been a, um, a, a good opportunity for career pathways uh, and higher job quality. Um, it'll be interesting to see to track how that changes um, in the new kind of post-COVID-19 uh, world. So uh, with that... Uh, I am going to uh, yeah, turn it over to – oh, sorry, one last thing. Uh, Phil Jordan, uh, is, who is my, my partner at BW, he really is the, the chief methodologist. Um, he would be a good person to contact. I put my uh, email down there. Uh, Sandy uh, Fazelli at uh, NASIO uh, is um, actively involved in kind of this, you know, in, in leading this, this, this project as well as uh, Jeanette Pablo uh, at EFI. Um, and they're working with, um, are leading the charge actually uh, in, in 2021 with uh, DOE for uh, user. So, that note, I will head back over to Suzanne. Great, thank you, Josh. Um, and in, we're taking your questions in the chat box and answering the ones uh, that we can. Um, you can see I put a link there to the report that uh, Josh was just talking about. And hopefully the technical, uh, you're getting answers to your technical questions as well. We're sending those just back to the, um, to the folks that ask them. But um, there is a content uh, question here, which we'll take at the, at the end of Jeremy's presentation, which is what caused the large jump from 2015 to 2016 in the slide there that you showed, Josh. And afterwards, we, maybe we can go back to that slide, but certainly to that question, uh, because I know other people are probably wondering about it as well. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Jeremy Stefik from the National Renewable Energy Lab. And Jeremy is an analyst at NREF. His research areas include workforce, uh, economics, and community development for land-based wind and offshore wind. Uh, Jeremy leads the wind workforce analysis, uh, analysis efforts, which seek to understand the needs of industry, educational institutions, and students. He manages the Jobs and Economic Development Impact Models, or the JEDI models, and also conducts economic impact analyses. And you can see, um, if you look up Jeremy on the NREL website, you'll see his, um, his publications there. So Jeremy, um, thank you, and uh, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Josh, for kind of setting that, the stage um, where the current U.S. wind energy workforce is. Um, so um, as Josh presented from the U.S. Energy and Employment Report, the wind in industry employment has grown by 49 percent since 2015. And the wind industry is really expected to continue to grow as more capacity is installed across America. And this is going to require both a diverse, inclusive, and highly trained workforce. And so in this next part of the session, we're going to share some of the insights on the challenges and opportunities faced by the wind industry uh, when hiring this qualified workforce. Um, and just as a note, we did uh, partner with BW Research Partnership uh, to really kind of understand some of these key insights for industry as well. And so in the next part of the session, we're really seeking to answer three main questions. So based on our previous research efforts, um, we've defined a that there is a gap in the wind workforce. So we'll kind of go into what the details of that particular gap. We'll talk about a recent survey effort, which we partnered with BW Research to understand the reasons behind this wind workforce gap. And we'll share key insights that are interesting to industry, but also have really key takeaways for the potential workforce, meaning students or recent graduates, and also US educational programs. So in 2019, uh, NREL published a report which concluded that there is a wind workforce gap. And throughout this presentation, when I refer to the wind workforce gap, what that definition really is, is that industry is reporting difficulty finding qualified applicants 
that fill many different occupations. But at the same time, students and recent graduates, which really make up this future potential workforce, are also reporting difficulty finding jobs. So on the industry side, 8% of industry respondents are reporting some or great difficulty finding qualified applicants. Bar chart here on the right breaks down that difficulty by occupation, with applied and field scientists and trade workers being the two most difficult occupations to fill. Um, and as you kind of look at all the different occupations here that represent the, the wind industry on the left, you can really see how many different types of occupations there are in the industry, just how many different training and skill needs there are um, for everything from manufacturing, construction, to engineers, to economists, to uh, lawyers, and uh, accountants and bookkeepers. So um, this is definitely one of the challenges with the industry is that there's so many different occupations that have uh, unique skill sets and finding um, finding qualified applicants across all these is definitely being reported as a challenge. Then on the on the potential workforce side, uh, we recently surveyed students and recent graduates to get a better understanding on how they feel their difficulty is in finding employment within the wind industry. So uh, overall, students are reporting that it is more difficult to find employment in the wind industry than other renewable or energy industries. So uh, as you can see here, this chart, around 55% of students or recent graduates who sought to enter the wind industry reported some or great difficulty finding a position within the wind industry. Um, and that's definitely um, the wind and energy industry is ranked higher than renewable energy, which we included solar, electric vehicles, um, and hydro and other positions. And comparing that to the energy industry overall, which would also include uh, traditional um, or conventional forms of energy. And also just wanted to note that this also aligns with what we hear from community colleges and universities across the country, where they say only around 20 to 30 percent of their graduates um, who are actually interested in, in finding a job in the renewable energy or wind industry actually enter the industry. And so NRO partnered with BW Research, um, who you heard from in this, the last presentation on the U.S. Energy and Employment Report, to better understand the wind workforce gap. Um, and we had great participation from the ind wind industry, so we want to extend a thank you to all the industry support for this particular research project. And so this wind workforce gap project, uh, it was funded by the Department of Energy and had an overarching goal of understanding the reasons behind the wind workforce gap, both in industry and the student and recent graduates perspective. And so on the industry side, we were look, really looking to understand the industry need, uh, kind of what skill sets are desired, awareness of U.S. wind educational programs, just some of industry's hiring processes of where they look for applicants. On the student and recent graduate side, we were really looking for perspectives on the difficulty of finding jobs and overall student interest in the industry. And so what we're really hoping is to better understand what this gap is and look for ways and solutions to improve connectivity between the industry and this potential workforce uh, so that uh, as the wind industry continues to grow, we're able to meet uh, industry's demand with a, a highly qualified workforce. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, we did partner with BW Research Partnership uh, to survey both the industry and student and recent graduates. Uh, the survey effort uh, occurred between March and June of 2020, kind of uh, during the start of COVID, but also um, uh, kind of going into that June timeframe. Uh, and this uh, occurred after the, the U.S. Energy and Employment Report was published. And so on the industry side, we had 296 responses, uh, which represent nine different industry segments, uh, which is this bar chart here on the right showing that we did get a good representation of manufacturing, construction, development, and siting, um, and all the, all the different industry segments that make up uh, 24 different occupations. And then on the student and recent graduate side, uh, we had around 769 responses from students and recent graduates across multiple education levels. And uh, this represented around over 70 U.S. Uh, vocational schools, community colleges, and universities. And so now we wanted to share some of these key insights from this latest survey effort. 
so just as the 2018-2019 the wind workforce gap um, sh that uh, NREL uh, seeks to produce every couple of years, um, it showed that the industry is having difficulty hiring. Um, here we have the difficulty broken out by both entry-level and non-entry-level positions. On the entry-level side, 65% uh, of the industry is reporting that they're having diffic difficulty filling entry-level jobs. And then this uh, table here at the bottom broke breaks out the hiring difficulty by entry level and non-entry level positions across the different industry segments. And for both entry level and non-entry level, you can see that manufacturing, research and development, and the construction segments of the industry are having the most difficulty finding applicants to fill their job needs. And then we definitely were seeking through this latest research effort to really understand the reasons of why industry is having difficulty, difficulty hiring. And so the three main uh, reasons that industry stated through the survey effort is that applicants lack training or education, applicants lack experience, or there's not enough applicants to fill a particular occupation or industry segment. So again, here at the bottom, uh, it's breaking out the, the top reasons indicated for hiring difficulty by different industry segments. So for manufacturing, um, industry was lacking, was noting a lack of training or education. Kind of the research and development space, uh, again, a lack of training or education was noted as a difficulty for hiring. For both the construction and this kind of education and training space, industry is reporting there's not enough applicants. On the, the O&M asset management side, um, industry is saying that the applicants lack experience. And development and siding, it's uh, a lack of training or education. But despite these difficulties, there's a lot of opportunities for wind workforce development. And so from the student and recent graduate surveys, we're really interested in how interested are students really in finding wind careers. So we asked, uh, uh, asked this uh, 770 respondents uh, how likely they were to apply for both a land-based or offshore wind industry job. On the traditional land-based side, 72% uh, are likely to apply if there was an open job position. And on the offshore side, uh, respondents indicated 63% likelihood of applying for an employment opportunity. Um, this particular chart is also pretty interesting that it kind of is showing that there is a, a role and a need to educate uh, these interested students in the opportunities of the emerging offshore wind energy um, industry. We also asked potential workforce what they thought about the wind industry. And so the, the industry receives high marks for uh, promising career pathways and work that aligns with environmental priorities. So this bar chart here on the right is we asked um, the, the potential workforce kind of uh, if they thought that across different attributes such as pay, uh, location of jobs, benefits package, um, opportunities to fit environmental priorities, if they thought the wind industry was better than average, about average, or uh, worse than average, comparing it to other comparable energy, uh, comparable industries. And so uh, as you can see, definitely the wind industry receives high marks in environmental priorities and a kind of a promising career pathway. Um, interesting to note here is um, the uh, area where they state the wind industry is worse than average is the opportunity to work in locations where they want to live. Which then tying that to this kind of student recent graduate challenges, um, their top three challenges that they noted through their survey effort was that the students or recent graduates felt like a barrier to entering the wind industry was a lack of experience, so getting relevant work and or industry experience uh, here we have geography noted again, so in finding employment opportunities that are near where I live or I'm willing to live, and then also getting hands-on training to develop specific wind energy skills. Um, the geography question is uh, a kind of a definitely an area that we want to dive deeper into. Some of the initial results show that it's much more difficult for students in suburban and urban areas to find employment uh, opportunities in the wind industry compared to those uh, who are located in more rural areas. And so to overcome these challenges, we need to ensure that the industry and students and graduates are connecting. 
uh, so part of the survey effort as well as we thought to understand where both the industry looks for a workforce and how the this potential workforce looks for jobs and so uh, here we uh, asked the industry, you know, are you using internships? Are you using career fairs? Are you recruiting from outside the U.S.? On the potential workforce side, you know, we asked, are you using job sites, career fairs, um, career services at your university, or recruiters, or somewhere else? Um, overall, industry is relying on internships and online hiring websites, while applicants are relying on hiring websites and career fairs. So in conclusion, um, we now have a better understanding of the WIN workforce gap. Uh, there is quite a bit of, of data that we've collected through both this industry and student and recent graduate survey effort that we need to dive deeper into. Um, and so definitely want to say that over the next couple months, um, we plan to hopefully put out some key information for industry, education, institutions, and students and recent graduates that really highlight some of the, the key findings to hopefully support uh, all these different groups to kind of come together and really have a, a highly qualified workforce to, to meet the growing demands of the wind industry. Um, but uh, the key kind of takeaway is that there's a lot of interest in wind energy careers by students, uh, but students and industry are both uh, pointing to experience as one of the barriers to growing the wind energy workforce. And so, you know, what kind of one of the themes for the rest of this uh, wind energy webinar week is really just to that how can we better connect um, students, recent graduates, education institutions, and industry together to, to really support wind workforce development. And, and so I encourage you all to uh, attend some of our uh, other upcoming web workforce webinars this week, which are part of the American Wind Week. Um, so you can register here at that link. But um, on Tuesday, we'll be uh, further exploring how we can both inspire and provide experience for the next generation of the wind workforce. Uh, which is the expanding the workforce development scope, why it pays to start young. And then on Wednesday, we'll have a panel discussion on solutions to connect the industry and the potential workforce, really looking at the higher education, community college, and university level. And so with that, um, I'll say thank you for everyone for tuning in today, and we'll open it up for both questions from Josh and the U.S. Energy and Employment Report, and also from um, this Wind Workforce Gap project. Great, thank you, Jeremy. We're getting a lot of great questions in the chat box, and maybe we can start, uh, Josh, with your slide about the jump in wind energy employment, industry employment from 2015 to 2016, and what you think may have caused that. Yeah, so um, we we didn't, we've had the, user has gotten more granular, and so we, um, in 2016, we actually applied kind of uh, the sector, you know, looking at construction and manufacturing. So I don't, I don't know exactly. We did see anecdotally from 2015 to 2016 an increase in terms of some of our conversations with employers in construction and engineering. Um, so I think, you know, in that in that that window, uh, there was just you know a lot of addition of new turbines that were being, a being you know developed and sited and actually you know installed. Uh, really, and we saw that kind of you know, even earlier in 2014, 2015, 2016, and, and 2017, and a lot of that I think got captured um, in the difference between 2015 and 2016. So from what we've seen, it's largely related to construction and engineering. Um, but we didn't start that, you know, real detailed split in 12, tw until 2016. So, um, you know, we, we probably need to, to dig a little more, but we did see an increase in just, you know, general installations. Great, thank you. Um, and then there are a couple of questions about unions, and um, I'm not sure if BW breaks that out. I don't think we did in in our um, in the in USEER, but maybe you have uh, data. But one of the questions is how the industry is addressing, um, the, and the commenter says low industry or low union numbers, and how that impacts traditional energy workers um, who are already in kind of a precarious situation. Yeah. Yeah, I know this is a, an area that we're we're looking at, and we will be looking at closely in 2021, and that we're for you know 2020. Um, so we do have uh, data on the workers that are uh, unionized. We've we've got a, a supplementary survey that we looked at that. So um, 
you know, a lot of that's driven by the industry sectors, uh, and construction is an area where it, it tends to be more fragmented and it tends to be smaller, uh, smaller employers, and there's not as many unionized. Uh, utilities, utility employment makes up a relatively small portion uh, of wind energy employment as well, and, and that tends to be an area where there, uh, there are more unions. So this is something we'll be looking at. It'll be interesting to see uh, in 2021 if it becomes uh, more or less unionized um, with the changes in the industry. You know, right now, given the industry sector kind of profile of a lot of, you know, kind of manufacturing and construction and wind energy, um, great. it's relatively consistent. Thank you. Um, that's great. And um, and then the other one that's kind of related to this is about the quality of jobs, and this might be for both of you, but how do the pay levels compare to um, fossil fuel jobs and um, kind of how many, you know, union jobs are there within the wind industry? Um, it, you know, do you, are there jobs that are full-time with benefits, that kind of thing? Um, so I guess just I guess that it's summed up by could you talk about the quality of the jobs in the wind workforce? Yeah, uh, and 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 Jeremy, feel free to jump in and uh, expand on or, or correct me if I'm uh, missing anything. But you know, it really depends, and it really depends on on the industry sectors. Um, on the whole, uh, the job quality of the wind energy workforce is higher than the typical national average workforce profile. So if we look at jobs. Um, we split them into three tiers. Tier one is a high-paying um, job that typically, you know, on average pays you know, $90,000 or more. Tier two is kind of a middle skill, middle wage job that on average pays about forty-five, fifty thousand 50000 nationally. And tier three is uh, a lower-paying job that, you know, is about twenty-five to 30000 So if you think about it, kind of these three tiers in terms of job quality, um, the wind energy workforce has a higher percentage of tier two and even particularly tier two jobs uh, but even tier one jobs than, than the national average workforce. If we compare it to the fossil fuel industry, you know, again, fossil fuels are, are pretty big, so it depends on you know, whether we're looking at you know, coal or, um, or natural gas or, or like that. Um, they're relatively comparable, but you know, not to coal, but to natural gas. Um, there are more opportunities for you know, high job quality or for job growth and job promotion. Uh, then nationally, um, I think we need to look at more data. Six percent of the of the wind energy workforce is unionized. So, uh, Jeremy, am I missing anything? Um, I would just add that it's the wind industry is really unique too, in that there are so many different occupations that require all kinds of different education levels, all the way from high school all the way up through PhD. So there's a lot of different entry points um, for a lot of different types and different paying types of jobs um, and, and so I would just note that you know um, on the kind of construction manufacturing side you know there's a, a big manufacturing presence in the US that is providing um, high quality manufacturing jobs and all the way up through um, you know, needing a, a highly skilled engineering workforce which maybe you know those jobs would be more comparable uh, to other kind of industries which require engineering type roles Mm -hmm. a, uh, a little data nugget that my, uh, my colleague Ryan Young just gave me. Um, electricians that are working in the wind energy uh, workforce on average make $4 more per hour uh, than the national average for electricians. So um, yeah, I think that, may, that speaks to kind of the need that Jeremy was just talking to about additional training uh, and expertise uh, and kind of technical you know, skills. Um, but are also electricians are one of those kind of ubiquitous jobs that are found throughout kind of the energy industry. Um, and on average, they're, they get $4 more per hour uh, than the, the national average. So I thought that's an interesting tip, but thanks, Ryan, for that. Yeah, that is. Um, the, the next question is about uh, workers in other industries. So it's about, and I think this survey was, you know, specifically done on the wind industry, but um, are there surveys that uh, that ask workers in fossil fuel in the fossil fuel industry about transition into the clean energy industries um, or are you doing any research on that so so user does do uh, the entire energy uh, kind of spectrum um, uh, we, we have in the past asked some supplementary questions uh, on transitions but I don't know if we have anything recently 
um, we are interested, you know, in, in this upcoming year to really look at those transitions. So I think it would be something that would be, would be valuable. I don't know if, we're, if, we've, if we've received the, you know, the, the, the green light to do that yet, but, but I think it would be really valuable. Um, and, yeah, user does include, you know, fossil fuels, you know, the entire energy spectrum. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. So the user, this one, this report that you've been doing research for for the last six years is all all energy, and um, and then the the ones that, the, the jobs that Jeremy was focused on are wind industry jobs, and that's when you know he was talking about education um, and gaps and things like that. That was focused on the wind industry, um, and I know in some of my work from the coal transition, um, people talk about, um, you know, coal workers and how they can um, have education that base, that gets them through, kind of gets them through high school, and then they can go right into a, a mining or a coal plant job, which is true, um, and they earn a really good salary. You can earn a salary, uh, a comparable salary as a wind energy technician, but you have to do training. Of course, you don't really want people climbing those wind turbines unless they've done the proper amount of training. So, um, it's not it's not something you can just you know go right into, but um, you can earn a good a good salary and they are full time with benefits also in the in the wind industry. Um, I guess we also just when people mention tr transitioning to clean energy, we have to be careful that we're not looking at um, that as a solution for all you know fossil transitions right it's not that where there is a coal mine and a coal plant there's necessarily a good solar resource or a good wind resource or a good you know hydro or geo geothermal resource it's it's going to be different places in the country and you really have to look at what the resource is before we dive into that and think about um, careers for uh, the local population in those areas um, okay so we've got some other uh, good questions um, does the gap for tradespeople this is for Jeremy I think uh, in wind correspond and align with other industries, so gaps that you've seen in other industries? Yeah, and I'll, I'll definitely let Josh fill in some of the, the details here as well. But I, I, I would say that the, the gap in the wind industry for tradespeople does align with several other industries. So I think from a kind of a national perspective, there is definitely a high demand for, for welder, welders and electricians um, to support both these manufacturing and construction roles uh, across different industries. And so I, th I think that's a good point that uh, the wind industry is in some ways um, competing to find those, those skilled workers, uh, which is why you kind of see that reasons for difficulty that there is that lack of, uh, lack of a, a workforce to, for those kind of critical roles. And, and so I think that's a, a great point that um, Yes, I, I would say that the wind industry is competing with other industries for those um, kind of key uh, specialty trades roles. And Josh, if you have any other uh, perspective. Yeah, yeah I would just, you know, yeah, no, I think that that was, I guess, right on, Jeremy. But I would say that I think when you look at the potential workers, the potential workforce out there, the wind energy has a pretty, you know, this is an, uh, an industry they want to work in. I mean, when you looked at, one of the, the questions that, that Jeremy, we, we looked at was, you know, would you be interested? So we asked the potential, the potential workforce, would you be interested in working in the wind energy industry? And, you know, we act, you know, natural gas and like that. And, and generally, wind energy, the wind energy and the solar industry uh, were highly received, meaning potential workers, people that are in school looking at these, these positions, you know, uh, wind energy was, was received the, I think the highest or the second highest of the industries tested and, and considerably higher than kind of uh, some of the traditional fossil fuel industries. So, um, and really there were two reasons for that. The ones, the two things they said is they, A, it really aligned with their environmental values, but B, they thought that it had uh, strong career pathways for them. Um, and so, you know, the perception among, you know, students and, you know, younger potential workers um, is that the wind energy should, you know, should be a good opportunity, uh, is, you know, is a good opportunity for employment for most. So, I think there are challenges, but I also think there's opportunities. Great, thank you. Um, kind of staying on this uh, wind workforce, in the wind workforce area, um, reasons for hiring difficulty uh, is, the, is kind of the topic, and what particular training is lacking? Um, when they were talking about training and education lacking, Jeremy, do you know, did, did, did folks say what it was? Was that part of it, or is that too specific? 
Um, so that is getting, I think, fairly specific where um, we, we have done some other research and kind of skills mapping and trying to understand what skills are needed for uh, these different occupations and industry segments. Um, I, I would say that that's definitely, I, I would say, a kind of a key area that industry and kind of education institutions can engage around is, yeah, what what kind of training is lacking. So if um, industry and education institutions can better kind of talk about what industry needs are and what kind of skills or certificates or training is required for different occupations, um, that would certainly, I think, help build the bridge the gap and make sure that um, these educational opportunities are, are training to meet industry's needs. Um, we do plan to kind of break, try to break some of this data down a little bit further. Um, right now, we're just at the industry segment, so manufacturing says there's a, a lack of training, but can we uh, break that down into kind of these occupational roles to say uh, which occupations are, um, are, are, are lacking training, and then kind of pair that with some type of career skills mapping to get a better sense of um, what kind of those key skills or certificates are needed for some of these key occupations. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I would encourage people to go to the Department of Energy's Wind Exchange. If you just, you know, search for Wind Exchange, um, you, um, you can get to the, their education page. And um, some of the information is there, or at least it will give you links um, uh, to this information. Um, we've got a question from somebody at a university asking how universities can help bridge the worker gap. Um, do they need to change curriculum, uh, be better connected to employers? Um, great question. That is a great question. Um, and I would say that that is kind of one of our key takeaways, I think, from this particular research effort as well, is that um, really bridging that industry and education program gap. And so uh, we did ask industry, you know, how are we how aware are you of U.S. educational programs? Um, and for the most part, the majority of industry is aware that there are universities across the nation um, that have both wind energy curriculum and courses. Um, but then the key is really um, how often is industry, you know, engaging with those universities to hire um, some of these more um, engineering project development type roles. and um, you know, we, we also ask like how often do you go to a career fair at these universities? And for the most part, industry isn't is engaging around career fairs as often. Um, and, and I would also note that the Department of Energy has several programs where we're trying to kind of bridge this industry and university uh, connection. Um, the collegiate win competition is a great example where um, students participate in kind of a, a turbine design and project siting competition. Um, and there is uh, industry judges, and it's, it, that program is really developed to try to give students uh, both curriculum and tr uh, hands-on training to succeed in the wind industry. And so this, this year, I know there was a lot of great examples where industry kind of tuned into that competition and uh, hired several of those uh, competitors for uh, key positions in their companies. So um, just want to highlight there that there are programs to help bridge that university industry. Um, gap, but that um, there is definitely a lot of work that both areas can work together to kind of improve upon. Yeah, and Josh, I don't know if you want to add to that, but I would say, you know, even from an, an earlier age with programs uh, like KidWind, um, they get people involved, and that's, I think, from fourth grade up, you know, in, the, in STEM education through high school and college where they're really trying to connect um, STEM education and then, you know, the college students are the mentors. And then when they get, you know, into their university, they can be um, in this collegiate wind competition that connects them to industry. So um, it doesn't reach a lot, of, a lot of people when you think about the broad population, but the people that it does reach have really had great experiences um, connecting to the wind industry and also just understanding more about you know, the concepts of, of wind energy and, and physics and, you know, getting to explore the STEM world a little bit. And, and I think energy overall, you know, understanding how it works and um, technology and engineering. So um, there's some great programs out there. Um, I was going to mention also that. 
Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, oh. Suzanne, I think that's that's right. I think the exposure component is really important initially because the wind energy workforce is really diverse. You know, there's scientists and engineers and construction laborers and finance professionals uh, and, and making people aware of all those different options and having universities recognize that, you know, maybe there's – there, you know, there's different sectors or, or components or occupational categories that they really need to kind of jump into as they're further along in the area. I think that's one of the challenges is, is it is so diverse. You're talking to people that are construction laborers as well as scientists as well as finance professionals and everything in between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, too, I was just going to add, I think that's really the focus of our, our Wednesday panel discussion is, uh, you know, it is kind of an open question of what are some innovative solutions to kind of help uh, to bridge that this what we're, the wind workforce gap, so bringing together uh, universities, students, and uh, industry to kind of have a dialogue on, you know, how can we help students get this experience training and provide those unique kind of connections that industry knows where to look to find um, applicants for their their jobs. Yeah, great. And that is a really good segue. I think um, Corey is going to hop back on from NREL and um, and show us again about what the what the um, schedule is for the next couple of webinars. Um, but I wanted to thank everybody for joining. And Corey, if you want to, um, maybe we can put the schedule up again for the next two and um, talk about those. Yeah, I'd be glad to. It, it was a perfect segue. Um, that just to remind folks of the conversations that we have coming up talking about um, early um, exposure to wind energy and to energy education um, we'll be really diving into that tomorrow um, so if you're interested in that topic please tune in there and then um, talking about this gap between the industry and the future workforce and trying to connect folks that are looking for employees and the students and other folks who are looking for jobs in the wind industry, um, we've got these great opportunities to be a part of that continued conversation. So um, I think, um, so yes, we hope that you will join us. Um, and then, you know, just want to reiterate that thanks to everyone for joining us on the webinar today and a big thanks to Suzanne for moderating the session and for the great presentations from Josh and Jeremy. Um, and then lastly, um, big thanks to the Department of Energy, Wind Energy Technology Office and to AWEA for helping to um, make this webinar series happen. And if you have any questions, um, you can get in touch with me and I can help connect you to um, Josh or Jeremy or Suzanne, whomever you have. Um, questions for. So thank you again, everyone, and we hope to see you on another webinar this week.